Hello everyone, how are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Harris and welcome to my channel. Today I'm gonna be reacting to Joey Diaz's true friendship at a memorial service. I haven't seen that bit so it will be my first time. So without any delays, let's get to it. Here we go. And she'd be in there watching like novellas with a scale, a bag of coke, a gun and a motherfucking chihuahua, you understand? <laughs> Who fucking has a chihuahua for protection? <laughs> a bad motherfucker. What's happening? <laughs> Is that his intro? Is that like from Telma and Louise? Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a great opening. I think so. Here's what happens. It's a bunch of comics telling true stories, and that's all it is. The man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Joey Diaz. You know, when I was a kid, my mom had a bar, and she was popular, so she had a lot of, like, girlfriends that hung out with her, like, hot girls. But there was this one chick that she used to be kind of tight with that I couldn't fucking understand with the friendship. Like, they would be on the phone all day, they would talk five times a day. If my mother was in the city, she would stop by a house. And then as I got older, I got the backstory that they knew each other in Cuba. And then uh, this lady's name was Z. That's what we're going to call her for this fucking story. Because <laughs> the names have changed to protect the innocent and all that shit. <laughs> so uh, they came from Cuba and Z married some dude and went to Chicago. My mom opted, went to New York, and like six months into the marriage, the, the guy was beating the hell out of Z, and my mom and my dad drove down there and saved her in the middle of the night and took her to New York, and she was indebted to them. And this is like 19 fucking 60. And, you know, as long as I remember, my mom used to go over there, and I like going over to where she lived, because she went on to become a huge drug dealer in New York. <laughs> right? On 113th and 5th Avenue in the mouth of Spanish motherfucking Harlem, right? <laughs> And it was scary. It was like The Walking Dead. You see, like, Puerto Ricans walking around. People fucking nodding on the sidewalks. It was just amazing as a little kid to see this. Fuck the circus and the zoo. These are real fucking animals. Like, hang in there. Laying in their own puke and shit. It's fucking tremendous. So, I like going there, too, because she always gave me, like, a 20 or a 50. As young as I was, she always dropped. And she always did a blast of coke no matter where the fuck she was, you understand me? So I would go over there, she'd pick me up, kiss me, and then go in her bra, do a line, and ask me how school was, and she went to my first communion. She did a bump kneeling down in the fucking thing. She don't give a fuck. That's a real crazy lady. Not one of these ladies with a tattoo and a hat with a feather. I'm so crazy. No, you're not, all right? No, you're not. You go to yoga at Studio City. You ain't that fucking crazy, all right? fucking crazy. Go to yoga and Compton, bitch, and then we'll talk. So, go into her house, guys. She lived on the second floor of a bodega, and this is at the mid-70s. You know, you knocked on Z's door, and a black guy opened the door, and he'd point you to the back, and I knew he was, I would run to the back, and she lived like in a, like in, she had like maybe three uh, rooms, you know, like a living room, but where she sold coke out of and heroin was this little room that had like beads in the front, like, you know, you opened it up and shit. And she'd be in there watching like novellas with a scale, a bag of coke, a gun, and a motherfucking chihuahua. You understand? <laughs> Who fucking has a chihuahua for protection? <laughs> a real badass. And she was dark Cuban, so she had big tits and an ass. Like, she was good looking, but she had blonde hair. It was tight. 30 years before Little Kim. I mean, she was way ahead of her. <laughs> Finally, like in the eighth or ninth grade, I figured out, you know, they were just good friends. They spoke all the time. Then my dad, my mom died. Yeah, and she was the first phone call I made. And she was the first one there, you know. She made all the funeral arrangements. You motherfuckers been to regular viewings with Gentiles where they sit around and cry and it's like, oh, he was such a great man. That's great. That, that's great. Then there's Irish fucking wakes where people are drinking and cursing and but then there's Cuban wakes. That makes an Irish wake look like a fucking daycare, okay? <laughs> they drink 24, and it's open 24 hours. 24 hours funeral parlor. And anything goes. People are doing lines, people are arguing, people are playing dominoes. People are playing fucking dominoes at my mother's fucking wake, okay? 
And the first night, I hear this commotion. And I go in the hallways. Z had the funeral director by the throat because she put the wrong dress on my mother. That is a fucking friend, motherfucker. Because right? <laughs> like anybody could be a fucking friend when you're alive. But to fucking be at your funeral smacking motherfuckers, right? <laughs> That's a friend, right? That's true. That's a fucking friend, you know? And she was checking people. Like, hey, fuck you. You didn't like her, and she didn't fucking like you. you know? <laughs> she was checking people, you know? And all these people in there, oh, we love Dinor and all this shit. You didn't hear shit from this lady. You didn't hear a word. There was no fakeness out of her. Right there, I learned what fake was and what real it was. At that early age, I learned that I saw it. Like, people come up to me, oh, my God, if you need anything. And after my mom died, I call them, and they change their fucking phone number. Yeah. But just little things that I saw right there, and I decided, oh, my God, that's what a fake person is. I love your mother. Oh, God, take me. All that shit. You know, the whole fucking four days of the wake, Z didn't say shit. She would every once in a while just sit in the back and just take a little bump out of her bra <laughs> and look at me and go. <laughs> and she would just watch what was going on. Even, and, and she was such a woman, like men would be having conversation. I'm not talking about regular fucking guys. I'm talking about Latin, old school, machismo motherfuckers. And she would go tell them shit, like shut the fuck up. Like, even they were scared of her. And I observed all this, like, how she had taken over from my mother. And then the last night, my mom got buried on a Monday. And that Sunday, I went outside to smoke a joint. Whatever the fuck you go outside of a wake for, to get air. <laughs> and when I came back, she was alone with my mother. It was the first time they were alone together. And she was kneeling down. And that's where I got it. She was uh, petting her hair. And she was telling her how beautiful she was and how the world wasn't gonna be the same without her, and how she was gonna miss her, and she was her sister. And it was just fucking mind-boggling. And then she said, and she turned, like she knew I was there, and she goes, I'm gonna take care of this motherfucker. <laughs> I'm gonna take care of him, I'm gonna watch over him, I'm gonna make sure he grows up to be a fucking man. And, and, and I saw the meaning of friendship right there when Z was petting her fucking hair and doing bumps. She did a fucking bump right there, right? She did a bump looking at the casket. She's like, I'd give you one, but... <laughs> What's the difference at this point? <laughs> but then it was after that. She stuck to her fucking word. Every Sunday, she'd come off from Long Island and meet me at Weehawken Cemetery, and she'd bring a bottle of Dewar's flowers, and she'd pour the bottle of Dewar's out and tell my mother how much she loved her, and she missed her, and she'd do some bumps. And by that time, I was doing coke. And she would like do bumps into the spirit, like, here's a couple for you. And I'd be like, no, give me, give them fucking things to me. <laughs> You're gonna fucking throw them on the grass. It's $20 a fucking blast there. <laughs> $20, $20, $20. Stop it already, give it to me. Is HelloFresh worth the price? Absolutely. In the beginning, I was doubtful too. Until I. So uh, this went on. She took care of me, guys, from 79 till 83 till I got out of high school. Every fucking Sunday, 200 fucking beans, and she'd bring me weed, a little $5 nickel bag from the city. And then in 83, I moved to Colorado, and you know I got into craziness and shit, but I always called her twice a week. I would send her pictures, you know. And then I moved back to Jersey, and by that time, I was a fucking lunatic, you know, and cocaine had absorbed me and stuff. And I kept in touch with her, and I would go into the city once a week and take her for a Cuban sandwich. There was a place on 118th Street we walked. And uh, I went and, and I went to Miami, and I found some friends of hers, and I beat them for like a half a kilo. And I just felt fucking bad. You know how it is, dog. <laughs> One bump leads into another. Next thing you know, you're having a party. Next thing you know, you did six ounces of blow. It's a fucking nightmare, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and there's no rehabs, there's no hugs, you know? They don't give a fuck, you know, that's it. So I felt embarrassed. I came back from Miami and I had fucked these people over. I felt embarrassed, so I didn't call. I didn't call her for like five months. And in January of 85, I finally got a little sober and I called her one day and I goes, Z, what's going on? And she's like, where the fuck have you been? She goes, you haven't called me in like five months. She goes, the cops raided me. They took everything. She goes, my leg broke and there was nobody here for me. And I felt fucking terrible. I let my mother down. I let myself down. I let Z down. And I was at a payphone, and I just dropped the fucking payphone. It was like a kick in my stomach, like she had just said, you know, where the fuck were you for me? For all those years, I was there for you, and you just disappeared on me. And I, was, I just felt terrible, and I, 
I walked away from the payphone. I didn't call her for about a week or two, and then I finally called, and the phone was disconnected. And I went over to the bodega a few times, and they told me that she got busted, and they closed the apartment, and I never talked to her again, and I, and I felt like shit, and I live with that today. And uh, that was 1985, you know, and I thought about it, and I digested it, and I swore to God that if I ever had a chance to be a friend to somebody, because you don't need 20 friends, you just need three motherfuckers, and you could take over a country. <laughs> Okay, that's what we're confused as Americans. We think we need all these motherfuckers. You give me three bad motherfuckers and you're finished. You understand me? You're fucking finished because that's, we got each that's other. True. And, and uh, you know, listen, man, uh, like Ari. Ari's my fucking goomba to the end. He might be a Jew or whatever, and I'm Cuban, <laughs> but that's my fucking goomba. And he knows that's why I'm here. Not because whatever, but. You know, I promised that I would be a, a, a friend to people and I would live and die for them. And, you know, when I look at people now, I always look at people sometimes and I go, how's that motherfucker going to feel when I die? Is he going to be talking shit at my funeral? Or is he going to squeeze my daughter and, and come see her every week and give her a toy? You know, and that's how I have to look at people. That's how I was raised, you know. And I always live with that guilt of not doing something for my friend. And then in 2007, I got off the blow. I quit doing cocaine, huh? don't ask, you know, don't clap. Nobody's supposed to do it anyway, you know. People are like, I'm off of drugs, you're an asshole. You're not supposed to do drugs <laughs> anyway, okay? Don't fucking break your arm tapping yourself in the back, asshole. So, uh, <laughs> right or wrong, these motherfuckers walk around with their water. I'm sober now, who gives a fuck? You know, you know two months ago you were sucking dick for rock at the Roxy. <laughs> now I gotta fucking shake your hand, fuck you. <laughs> Fuckers don't know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I got off coke. I had been off coke like four days. <laughs> <laughs> and that was tough for me. I used to go like 18 hours, and I'm like, ooh. <sighs> That's a long fucking time, you know? I was clean for four days, and a dear friend of mine died. She was a comedian. She died of cancer. And, uh, there was this one producer that used to mess with us all the time here in L.A. He would have these festivals and tell us that he was going to book us and then decide, oh, no, no, I'm not hiring dirty comics this year. Why would you have to work so dirty? He'd make us feel bad about being dirty comics. We were just expressing who the fuck we were, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I saw him then. He had messed with me and Marilyn a couple times, and I saw him at the church, right? I saw him at the church, but it was 10 o'clock. I was a little on the stone side. I said, I might as well not say nothing to know. You know, sometimes you do a bong hit before church just to calm your nerves. <laughs> you know, sometimes just one and a half, just to, you know, just to loosen you up before church. <laughs> and, uh, because church sucks without a bong hit. Trust me, that's, that's why it sucked as a kid. Once you start doing bong hits, church ain't that bad. <laughs> it's a fucking hour, people shake hands, they give you a cookie, you know, everybody, <laughs> peace be with you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Right or wrong? Please be with you, brother. Please be with you. Please be with you. His love, so, though, man. Uh, that night they had a memorial at a comedy club, and when I walk into the memorial, well, they had free food at the memorial. Like this, like they had. They didn't have, they buried it that day? But they had like a microphone. They had a picture where you're gonna go up and say words. Then they had free food. When I walk in, guess who's eating the fucking free motherfucking food? Yeah. That motherfucking producer. <laughs> Now, by that time, I'm, it's after 8 o'clock. The cocaine addiction is growing. I'm getting madder by the minute. I'm Cuban. It's fucking just, it's just developing, right? And they come over to me. They go, listen, we do the memorial. Can you go up on stage first? And, and I'm like, absolutely. And I'll get my words over and I'll get the fuck out of here. So I go home and go to sleep before I choke this motherfucker too, right? <laughs> so they said, Joe, come into the stage. Joey Diaz, I go on stage. People, you know me. I talk for like a minute, and, I can't, and this motherfucker's over there with that smile on his face. You know when somebody's got like that smile on their fucking face? A smug face. And in the middle of my memorial, I just stopped. And I go, I don't know what the fuck you're smiling about, motherfucker, you know? <laughs> but I tell you what, I'm gonna go get a drink, and when I get back, you, your wife, and that fucking attorney better get the fuck out of here, because I'm gonna fuck you motherfuckers up. And I was <laughs> serious, Jack. I was Lost fucking it. serious. Like, I was done. Like, seven days without a line of coke. This motherfucker, this is my out. I'll beat him up. And then fucking they'll throw me in county jail for 30 days. By the time I got out, I'll be clean and sober. I mean, that was my fucking... <laughs> That's how you got to think when you're fucking addicted, how I was, you know? 
But I was really pissed about what this motherfucker had done to me and to Marilyn and how he had the balls to show up at this fucking wake with that smile on his fucking face. And as I went to the drink and I came back in and him and his fucking family were gone, when I walked to my car, I thought about one thing. That I'm true. I, I, I did what I had to do. Without even knowing, I stuck up for one of my friends who had died. And that night, I became that much better as a human fucking being. I made my peace with Z. I made my peace with my mother. And most importantly, I made my peace with myself. And that's my story about that. So, that was Joey Diaz, Friendship at a Memorial Service. Uh, that was a lot different from what I've seen him do before. Uh, that was more uh, emotional, touching, and a bit more into the past of Joey Diaz. Uh, or you may call it Lit Little Joey. Uh, and that was actually there were some really good jokes, but the whole thing felt more like a uh, memoir from his past and how he's evolved into an individual he's today. Like uh, he didn't start doing comedy uh, uh, till I think since two thousand five or six. That's when he started, or a bit earlier. I'm not hundred percent sure. But that was really, really good, and I really enjoyed the bit he's talking about. You don't need 20 friends, you just need three good friends that can take down the country. That's absolutely brilliant. I really like that. And the overall thing was great. I did enjoy that. It was a bit longer from my uh, normal stand-up I watch, but it was uh, it was good. I really did enjoy that. Hope you did too. If you did, check out my other video for Joy Diaz. Also, like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment, and I'll see you guys next time.